All right, let's go ahead and open our Bibles this evening to Acts chapter number 11. Acts chapter 11, as we continue with the life of Paul. Acts chapter 11, let's begin at verse number 19. It says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the, or upon the persecutions that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were gone or come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was at, in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with, uh, that with purpose of heart they would ha uh, cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first that are in Antioch. Our Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord, and I pray that you would speak to our hearts through the message you have for us tonight. I pray that you would just uh, move in us and help us to realize that ministry is about all of us and not just one or two or a few. Help us understand we all have a place, we all have a purpose, we all have a reason. And Lord, just to help us to realize this as we are spoken to by your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Leonard Bernstein, the late composer and famed conductor of the world-renowned New York Film Harmonic, was once asked what he believed to be the most difficult instrument in the orchestra to play. And he responded, second fiddle. See, when you examine the life of any great person, you will soon find an entire section of second fiddlers, support people, gifted in their own rights, but content to play their parts seated in the second chair. And most of us could name leaders who have influenced our lives greatly. In fact, you and I could probably name several who at a crucial time stepped into our lives, fed our souls, and met a certain need. And if we were to tell these people how we've been impacted, how we've been influenced by their lives, they'd probably be very surprised about that. And you know, it's kind of funny how we... Uh, view such high-profile people. We tend to think of these people as loners, soloists, if you will, who come on the scene, make a great contribution, then disappear into the sunset. Kind of like many of the Clint Eastwood movies, right? What's your name again? <laughs> Julie just loves Clint Eastwood movies. You know, here's a town or situation that has uh, been taken over by the bad guys. And he comes riding in, covered with dust, six shooters strapped by his side. And he single-handedly clears the town of all the bad guys. And then he hops back on his horse and he gallops off into the sunset. See, that's how we tend to view people who come on the scene and do great things. But when you take the time to look, you'll soon discover that the one you considered as a lone ranger had a tonto or two. And you find that they are surrounded by numerous people, second fiddlers, if you will, whom without, they could not have made the impact that they did on the lives of so many people. You see, God, God's family is filled with second fiddlers. Men and women who faithfully and diligently serve as backup to those first chair heroes. 
And the Bible has plenty of second fiddlers. Here are some some outstanding second fiddlers. And one is Moses. Moses had a second fiddler in his life. It was his brother Aaron. And together they led the Hebrews out of Egypt and on a harsh wilderness journey toward Canaan. And then David had Jonathan, all right, a friend who stuck closer than a brother. He also had his mighty men who he names right down to the last one, over 20 of them, who faithfully served their king behind the scenes. And at times courageously, even heroically, they flirted with death. And then there was Elijah. Elijah stood against King Ahab and his idol-serving wife Jezebel. And still, if we're not careful, we can forget his second fiddler, Elisha. He became invaluable to Elijah, especially during his slump into deep depression when Elijah hit bottom, despairing of life itself. And then Jesus. Jesus set the rule when He sent His disciples out to minister in pairs. Mark 6-7 says this, And He called unto Him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two, or two by, by two by, and two. See, He never sent the disciples out to do the work in the ministry alone. They went with one another. And they served more efficiently and effectively because of it. And church history also includes many examples of great people accomplishing great things for the Lord, surrounded by the lesser-known second fiddlers. We see in the 19th century the power of two in the ministry. One named D.L. Moody and the other Ira Sankey. See, Moody was a powerful preacher, but he was unrefined. And he needed Sankey's smooth, accomplished voice. And together, all right, together, they did a better job of bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to many of those largest city, cities in America and Europe. Using both men, God literally shook two continents for Christ. And then some of us know and remember the late Dr. Lee Robertson, one of the great preachers of our time, founder of Tennessee Temple University and Highland Park Baptist Church. He had the late Dr. J.R. Faulkner as his co-pastor for most of his ministry, I believe. And I had the privilege of meeting both of these great men of God. And I'm sure that Dr. Faulkner did many things behind the scenes to help this great man of God named Lee Robertson. And any one of these men would tell you this, we couldn't have done it alone. And that's the point. Listen, we're not supposed to. Okay? We're not supposed to. We're not designed to be loners in real life and especially in ministry. There's no place for for Rambos or 007 secret agents or spiritual superstars. And it's sad when a pastor feels that the ministry is supposed to belong to him and him alone. Afraid that if someone else does something, then they'll get the credit and not him. Hogwash. God is the one who's supposed to get the credit. Amen? Not us. But He uses us and He expects us to work together, not alone. And not only is it unhealthy, it's simply not God's way. When He calls a man or woman to accomplish something great, He brings alongside other individuals who serve and help the more public figure. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12 says it very well when it says this Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, Who shall withstand him? And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Listen, God never intended anyone 
to go it alone. Never. You know, sometimes you hear people say, well, all I need is Jesus. Well, yes, everybody needs Jesus, no doubt about it. But Adam was created. He didn't have anybody else. He had perfect fellowship with God, unbroken fellowship with God. Nothing marred by sin. But what did God say? What did He say? To, what did He say? Come on, you know. There you go. It is not good for man to be alone. Exactly. We need other people, right? I mean, Adam had perfect fellowship with God. But God still said He needed someone else. He needed flesh and bones that were just like Him. We all need help. In life and in ministry. All of us need help. And the greater the, the, the task, the more help we need. You know, strange and unwholesome things happen to those who fail to stay close to others. Consider the words of Stanford University psychologist Philip Zimbardo in a piece that he wrote for Psychology Today titled The Age of Ind Indifference. He writes this, I know of no more potent killer than isolationism. There is no more destructive influence on physical and mental health than the isolation of you from me and us from them. It has been shown to be a central agent in the cause of depression, paranoia, murder, schizophrenia, rape, suicide, and a mass in a wide variety of disease states. Wow. Isolationism brings on a lot of those maladies. Isolation, just being alone, being separate from people. Listen, you don't have to be an expert to know how dangerous it is to be alone. So, once again, let's look at the book of Acts where we find that, that Barnabas has left to find Saul. See, Barnabas had realized that he had reached his limitations in meeting the growing needs in Antioch. And as we study Paul's life, Barnabas was a faithful second fiddler. And what Barnabas needed now was a virtuoso. He had an overwhelming task ahead. Again, let's read our, te our text. Verse 19. <clears throat> And they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but to own, unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And the great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, and he, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all. And with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus, or to seek Saul. And when, they had, when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So let's put the scene in Antioch into some perspective. Besides the large number of converts that needed to be taught, what made Barnabas' task, Barnabas's task so hard? Well, there were two issues, okay? One was religious and the other was cultural. He had the challenge of religious ignorance. All right? Because revival had spread as far as south as Jerusalem, all the way north into Phoenicia, an ever increasing number of new believers were Gentiles, with particular practically no exposure to the religious heritage of Judaism. In short, they were ignorant of God. They were untaught in the Scriptures. And Barnabas himself was from Cyprus, 
And, and that had some advantages since he knew the Greek language and understood their culture. But still the challenge was overwhelming. All right? That was only part of the problem, though. The second one was a culture of moral debauchery. A culture of moral debauchery. Not only were these Gentiles coming to, into the Christianity from a completely non-Jewish background, they were tainted by the moral decay of first century Antioch. See, Phoenicia was no holy land, and Antioch was no Jerusalem. Phoenicia was a pagan region, and Antioch, its center, was a city of about a half a million people, known for chariot racing, gambling, prostitution, corrupt government politics, and unbridled moral debauchery. Sounds strangely familiar, doesn't it? And it may have been those tempting pleasures that lured many of these new converts into the city in the first place before they were saved. The worship of Daphne was there. Her temple was five miles out of the city, and it was home to a number of prostitute priestesses. And remarkably, Acts 11.21 says that despite all this, the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Try to picture this. Let's try to put it into our day. A large city in America, like Aurora, known for its moral looseness, being impacted by an outpouring of God's Spirit. And revival sweeps through its neighborhoods, and before long, casinos and crack houses start to empty. And adult bookstores and massage parlors lose their clients. Churches in the area, which at one time wondered whether they should board up their their sanctuaries now burst at the seams with new converts, most of whom are former gang members, gamblers, prostitutes, criminals, drug addicts, and pornographers. And everyone needs in-depth instruction in the Scriptures, training in righteousness, personal counseling, and mentoring. See, that was the scene that Barnabas stepped into in Antioch. And it was very demanding of him. The place was full of brand new believers. And only in Antioch there were no churches. There were no churches there. There were no seasoned pastors to help carry the load. No knowledge of the truth of God. And very little understanding of Christ. So try to imagine how Barnabas must have felt. The duplicity of his emotions at this time. He felt absolute joy at what was taking place in Antioch. But at the same time, he must have been extremely frustrated. Duplicity, joyful and frustrated at the same time. And then the challenge only intensified as the revival continued. Luke writes, a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. See, the more Barnabas ministered, the greater the crowds became. And finally he realized Hey, I'm, I'm in this way over my head. And man, I tell you what, I'm exhausted. And he desperately needed a partner in the work. See, there's a remarkable power of two. Barnabas knew where to find his number one man in Tarsus. And there he would find his friend Saul, humbled, willing, and available. Barnabas knew that he alone didn't have the skill or the gifts needed to pull together a ministry as large and diversified as Antioch. Together, by God's grace, the two of them could team up and accomplish incredible things. And their differences would work for them, all right? Not against them. Their differences, they were different people. Their differences could work for them, not against them. See, Barnabas was raised in Cyprus, a rural setting. Saul came from Tarsus, an intellectual center, and had been schooled in Jerusalem in the disciplines of logic. Barnabas was an encourager. In fact, that's what the word Barnabas means. Saul, a gifted preacher and a scriptural scholar. 
Barnabas was compassionate and loving. Saul was, uh, he demonstrated remarkable grit and unwavering determination. Barnabas greatly reached, graciously reached out to the downtrodden and needy. And Saul was naturally drawn to the intellectually curious. The two worked together. They were extremely different, but they worked together. And with Barnabas at his side, Saul would deliver the theological messages that would strengthen these new believers in their faith. Together they would prove to be a powerful force in establishing the church in Antioch. In fact, that may explain Luke's words at the end of verse 26 when he said, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. The theology, organization, and structure these two pastors laid place in place formed the foundation of the first solid ministry in Antioch. And looking back over the last several years of Saul's life, it isn't hard to understand why he was an excellent choice for this critical leadership role. See, the man had successfully completed all the internal work that God's schoolroom for an effective ministry could bring him. God had revealed himself and his truth to Saul. His character had been shaped in the shadows, obscure, away from everybody else, all alone. With nothing to prove, he was ready to go and willing to spend himself for the glory of God. Now let me make even this, this even more practical. Saul wasn't really ambitious. All right, If he had even heard about the Antioch revival, he didn't rush down there and make himself known. Okay, I'm here. I'm going to take over. I'm Paul, a Saul. I'm Saul. You probably heard of me. No, he didn't. He didn't stoop to self-promotion. Barnabas had to enlist him. And Saul may have even gone to Antioch reluctantly. He may not have even wanted to go. Do you remember what David did after he killed Goliath? God had already appointed the young shepherd the next king of Israel, right? And he certainly earned his regal stripes in that <laughs> courageous standoff with the Philistine giant. And most young conquerors would have been full of themselves and, and begin to try on crowns, you know? Let's see what this one looks like. I'm ready. I'm ready. Not David. Not David. He went right back to the Judean hills to keep his father's sheep. A true shepherd with a servant's heart. You know, I've met too many preachers who are full of themselves. And that isn't the least bit attractive. One preacher in particular who I knew of from Hoosier Hills Baptist camp preached way past his allotted time every time he would preach. All right. All the preachers had a certain time that they had to keep. They were up there. They were supposed to stay within that time frame because other people would preach. So you had preachers. You had maybe three or four preachers in one night. So everybody was supposed to keep in their allotted time. The last time I heard him, and I can remember his name. I won't say it. You probably wouldn't know it anyway. But the last time I heard him, he took almost all of the time scheduled for the next preacher. Almost all of it. And I... I'm not exaggerating. I wanted to get up and walk out. I really did. Listen, that's being full of yourself. That is being totally obnoxious and full of yourself. When you think that you're the only one who has a message worth listening to, then you have a serious problem with humility. When you think that you're the only one who knows the Bible, you think that you're always right and everyone else is always wrong, then you have a problem with humility. But there's nothing more attractive in a gifted and competent leader than authentic humility. And Saul was such a man. He was humble. Now I've already mentioned D.L. Moody. All right, He was unschooled. He butchered the English language. All right, He butchered it. But he was a gifted man of God. And once he was preaching in Birmingham, England in 1875. And a noted congregational minister 
and well-respected theologian Dr. R.W. Dale cooperated in that enormously successful campaign. And after watching and listening to Moody preach and witnessing the incredible results of the ministry of that simple man, Dr. Dale wrote in his denominational magazine, he said this, I told Mr. Moody that the work was most plainly of God, for I could see no real relation between him and what he had done. And Moody cheerfully laughed and said, I should be very sorry if it were otherwise. Wow. No defensiveness, no feeling of being ridiculed, no embarrassing uneasiness. Moody was the most surprised of anyone that God had chose him and used him so mightily. You know, at the Moody Bible Institute, they have a museum dedicated to Moody's life. And they have an actual recording of him reading from the Bible. He's reading the Beatitudes. And you can listen to that recording of him reading. And they also have a recording of Ira Sankey playing the organ and leading in the singing. Now, I can only imagine how they would be looked on today in today's church atmosphere where people are supposed to be gifted speakers and great singers. I guarantee you, some would even accuse Moody and Sankey of being boring. Boring. Guarantee it. Moody was the most surprised that God chose to use him so mightily. And that was Saul. No wonder Barnabas wanted Saul to lead the program at Antioch. And together they played a wonderful duet. For an entire year, these two men served side by side, and God was greatly glorified. Warren Wisby gives this definition of ministry. He says this, Ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. Let me say that again. Ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. Why did Saul and Barnabas experience such great pleasure in serving together? There was no competition. There was no battle of egos. No one was threatened by the other's gifts. No hidden agendas. No unresolved conflicts. And again, I, I've been there. I know what this looks like. Their only goal was to magnify Christ. And it didn't matter if the crowds multiplied to the thousands or shrank to just a few. It mattered not to them. All that mattered was that Christ was proclaimed and worshipped. Period. That's all that mattered. And that's the same way it should be in every church. And in every ministry. And that's the way it should be here at New Hope Baptist Church. Listen, numbers don't matter as long as Christ is proclaimed and worshipped. Amen? It's not about us. It's not about us. It's about Him. It's always about Him. When we make it about us, we're in trouble. It's always about Him. As long as Christ is being glorified here and He's being worshipped, that's all God cares about. That's all He cares about. Well, let's look at some timeless essentials for ministering together. In every ministry, there are at least three essentials that produce an atmosphere of cooperation. There are objectives, people, and places. And each one, we're going to look at each one as we close this evening. The first one is this. Whatever God plans, He pursues. Whatever God plans, he pursues. That has to do with the ministry essential of objectives. God's plan for our ministry together at New Hope Baptist Church goes far beyond anything that you and I can imagine. And listen to this. God's work will outlive us if Christ tarries. Amen? I pray to God that this church never closes. No matter where God takes me, no matter who he brings in next, it, this ministry is not about me, it's not about you, it's about Christ, and it should continue long after we're gone, unless the Lord returns. 
I pray that that happens, really. He could come right now, and that would be awesome. We're out of here. That would be great. But his plan is always full of surprises, and it's as deep as it is wide. And then God's, God's work has nothing to do with my personal agenda. It's not a church board's five-step plan to reach the community or the per- personal preference of one outspoken person. It's about what God wants to accomplish through each of us working together. Okay? Together. That, that's, that, that secret is to that last word. Together. Listen, we're to be in one accord in this church. In all churches, we are to be in one accord. Acts 2.1 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one, with one accord in one place. With one accord. That means they were together. There were no conflicts, no divisions, no special interests. They were in one accord. And listen, we're to work together for the glory of God. And unfortunately, some people seem to do nothing but cause divisiveness wherever they go. It becomes all about them. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a clearly defined mission statement that gives direction and purpose to the vision of the ministry. In fact, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. There's everything right about it as long as the Lord provides it a direction. God's plans unfold in ways that confound human wisdom and defies human human sense sometimes, common sense. In other words, we wouldn't do it this way, but that's the way God wants it done. That's what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with having a vision, nothing wrong with proclaiming this, but when God works in and when God steps in, His plan is that one we're supposed to follow. It's His plan. And objectives are essential when they are His objectives not ours. And then secondly, whomever God chooses, He uses. Whomever God chooses, He uses. This has to do with the ministry essential of people. And I need to inform you that the people of God, the people that God chooses, the people God uses, are never perfect. And that includes me, and that includes you. Listen, if I had to stand behind this pulpit, if I had to be perfect to stand behind this pulpit, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. And neither would any other preacher, by the way. In fact, we prove most useful to the Lord when we accept the reality and trust Him with our imperfections. Now that doesn't mean that we're free to live in the flesh Okay, it doesn't mean that we're to rely on carnal plans and self-serving arrangements to meet our objectives. All right, that's not what it means. But all of us are imperfect. All of us. The scriptures urge us over and over to walk in purity and holiness. 1 Peter 1 verses 14 through 16 says, "And as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, that's manner of life, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. All right, we are to understand that even though God chooses to use us, our imperfections don't go away. And let me warn you, if you fix your hopes and attentions on any one person, then you will be brokenhearted. Everyone has feet of clay. And just as that included Barnabas and Saul, that includes us also. Resist the temptation to put people on pedestals. You know, we all have our heroes. We all need heroes. You know, I have my heroes, but I can't name one who is anywhere near perfect. Not anywhere near. Now, I'm called to be a godly example as a pastor, and you should expect that from me but I always won't live up to your expectations. I will fail at times. Mark it down. I failed in the past. I'll fail in the future. And it's sad that people feel that they have to leave the church because I'm not perfect. I'm not meeting their so-called expectations, their spiritual needs. 
Listen, I fail. Jesus never fails. Amen? It's about Jesus, folks. People need to come here with their mindset on Jesus. We can admire and appreciate people, but don't adore them. Like Saul and Barnabas, let's keep the focus on Christ. And then thirdly, wherever God selects, He sends. Wherever God selects, He sends. Now that has to do with the ministry of His essential of places. His places are not the places that we would choose to go on our own. Listen, I've said this before, but I would never have chosen to start a church here. That wasn't my choice. That was a farther thing from what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to Kentucky. A church running 200 people already had a building to step in there, and that's what I was thinking. Start a church? I have no idea how to do that. I have no clue. I have the foggiest idea how to even go about it. Never would I ever, ever expected to do that. Never. But God chose the place that He wanted me to be. And He changed my mind. And here we are. God sends the people of His choosing to the places of His choosing. And the sooner we accept that truth, the more content we'll be. But let me remind you, going where He sends us will, not, will, or will test our faith. <laughs> Oh boy, doesn't it test your faith. Tell you what, starting a church and being here for this long has tested my faith, Kathy's faith, all of our faith at times, right? Amen? We're all in this together. It's tested our faith. All right? John Eldridge in his book, Wild at Heart, writes this. Life is not a problem to be solved. It's an adventure to be lived. That's the nature of it and it has been since the beginning when God set the dangerous stage for, his high stakes, for this high-stakes drama and called the whole wild enterprise good. He rigged the world in such a way that it only works when we embrace risks as the theme of our lives, which is to say, only when we live by faith. A man just won't be happy until he's got adventure in his work, in his love, and in his spiritual life. Let's see, ministering together is always an adventure. It's about, exchange, it's about embracing change. It's about maintaining flexibility. It's about working with God through the surprising events that He has designed. Barnabas needed help. The work was too much for one gifted but limited man. And Saul stepped into the gap, and together they turned Antioch Upside down for Christ. Let me conclude with these thoughts. This thought. Ten years ago, you could not have predicted where you'd find yourself today. Chances are good, even five years ago, you couldn't have done that. You may have thought that you'd be living in the south, but now you're living up north. You might have been happily married, but now you're divorced. You might have thought that you were secure in your job. Today, you might not even have that job. So much has changed. Instead of feeling unfulfilled and, and of feeling fulfilled and encouraged, your heart may be broken today. Or you may be facing retirement with all the uh, anticipation and uncertainty that comes with that. Here's my message for you in one simple statement. Don't try to manage it all alone. Don't go it alone. Hebrews 10.25 Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. What that is saying is we can't go it alone. We're not supposed to go it alone. We need each other. We need to assemble together. We need to encourage each other. We need each other. Amen? We do. We're not to be lone rangers. I read time and time again in some of the blogs and some of the articles that I read how people are just saying, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian and 
uh, churches hurt me, and I don't want to like this, I don't like that, and I'm thinking, you poor people. All the excuses why not to go to church. But God commands us to be together. God commands us to encourage one another. We need one another. The Christian life is a team effort. God designed it that way. So let's cooperate, okay? We're in this thing together. Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord. We thank you for the time that we have together tonight. We thank you for what we've learned tonight. We need each other. We need each other in life. We need each other in ministry. We're not to do it alone. I just pray that you'd speak to our hearts tonight in any way that you will and move in us. And may we leave here changed because of what we've heard and with a fresh and new perspective about what the Christian life is truly about. Now, Father, may your Holy Spirit have his way as we sing this song of invitation, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.